Good morning. The subcommittee on space will come to order. Without objection, the chair is authorized to declare recesses of the subcommittee at any time. Welcome to today's hearing entitled NASA Cost and Schedule Overruns, Acquisition and Program Management Challenges. I will now recognize myself for five minutes for an opening statement. NASA is at a critical juncture as it lays out the details of its roadmap for human exploration missions while determining the best business approach to success. However, human exploration doesn't encompass the breadth of NASA's total work. They are also launching interplanetary spacecraft systems, advancing science and aeronautics re uh, research, and developing critical technologies to enable U.S. leadership in space. Strategic acquisition planning, utilization of new contracting mechanisms, and improving management and oversight will be a crucial part of effective, affordable, and sustainable mission success for NASA. As chairman of the Space Subcommittee and a proud representative of Johnson Space Center in Houston, I am a tireless advocate for NASA. However, as members of this committee, we have a responsibility to every taxpayer to ensure that NASA is being a good steward, managing the resources with which we have been entrusted. Today's hearing will touch upon a number of important oversight topics, including acquisition mechanisms, cost estimation methodologies, and NASA program management. Procurements represent over 90% of NASA's annual budget. In fiscal year 16, NASA procured over $18.6 billion through nearly 41,000 active procurements. That's a tremendous amount of work. Unfortunately, NASA has been plagued for years with contract management issues, which have resulted in substantial cost overruns and schedule slips. Generally, it's the high-profile major programs which get the most scrutiny because of the funding and time associated with these procurements. However, there are other well-documented issues, many of which could constitute and possibly warrant a dedicated hearing. In May of this year, the Government Accountability Office released its annual assessment of major NASA projects, those exceeding $250 million in appropriations. This assessment covered 26 major projects. I'd like to note uh, the subcommittee will have a dedicated hearing about the James Webb Space Telescope next month. But this project's long history of cost and schedule overruns is relevant to today's discussion as well. GAO reported an overall deterioration in the major program portfolio primarily due to the fact that nine out of 17 projects in development are experiencing cost and schedule performance growth as a re result of risky program management decisions, significant technical challenges and issues beyond the control of the projects. Last year, GAO assessed that NASA projects were continuing a generally positive trend of limiting cost and schedule growth maturing technologies, and stabilizing designs. However, GAO also noted that many of the more expensive projects were approaching the phase of their life, or their life cycles, when cost and schedule growth is most likely. The subcommittee will also investigate specific NASA cost estimating methodologies, such as the joint cost and schedule confidence level, uh, the JCL process and NASA management techniques related to uh, project schedule determination and the use of headquarters reserve funding. We are particularly interested in the NASA Inspector General's uh, recommendations on improvements with NASA's cost estimating methodologies, especially if there is a need to continue using the JCL process or adopt another cost estimating technique. Furthermore, the subcommittee will investigate these and other questions. What acquisition mechanisms, cost plus, fixed price, award fee, space act agreements, et cetera, are most appropriate for various types of procurements? Next, how do these acquisition tools incentivize the provider to perform safely and efficiently? 
What are the pros and cons? And then, are existing appropriation funding authorities sufficient for congressional oversight of major NASA projects? And lastly, do current agency approaches hold both the agency and provider accountable for overall performance? And this is a very timely hearing today. In their report last month, GAO noted that NASA is planning to invest about $61 billion over the life cycle of its current portfolio of 26 major programs. And that doesn't even account for thousands of other procurements and a significant portion of NASA's spending authority. Whether large or small, all of NASA's business decisions uh, uh, matter. Decisions made now have long-lasting implications on NASA's mission success and leadership. I want to thank the witnesses for being here. I'm sorry I was a little bit late and didn't get a chance to, to shake each of, your, each of your hands, but we're looking forward to your testimony on the challenges that NASA is facing in controlling program costs and schedule. So now I'd like to, uh, uh, to recognize the uh, ranking member of the subcommittee uh, from California, Mr. Barrow. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you for having this timely hearing. And, and welcome to the witnesses. I, I do look forward to, to your testimony. You know, when you think about NASA, NASA is a unique agency. It's a source of national pride for, for us, but it also is a cutting edge agency that um, serves to inspire. And, you know, when those of us who grew up during the space race certainly understood that inspiration and it motivated many of us to go into the sciences. You know, I, I want to also acknowledge, you know, it's not that often we walk into a hearing room and we see a line of, of folks waiting to get in here. And, you know, I think we're joined by NASA's interns um, and that next generation that, that hopefully is, is going to inspire, discover, and move us forward. So, you know, thank you to the interns that, that are here. You know, you are the future. You know, in terms of thinking about um, Congress's role here, we clearly have a, a role of fiscal responsibility and oversight, um, and you know, those at NASA don't have, a, have an easy job. I mean, you are trying to think about what that future looks like. You are trying to put those projects to, together, and you know, I appreciate that, that check and balance as you're doing things that we've never done before. You often encounter the unexpected. And, and I think that's why this is um, a, an important hearing. You know, resolving cost and scheduling issues are hard, and there really is no simple fix for you know, these types of situations. That said, um, you know, I have no doubt that NASA's <coughs> talented workforce is looking to find those improvements of how it conducts project management, oversees its contractors, collaborates with international partners, provides greater funding certainty, and applies cost estimation tools and techniques. But today's discussion of scheduled delays and cost increases and the search for corrective actions cannot take away from the accomplishments and discoveries made by programs like Hubble, the International Space Station, and Mars Curiosity. These accomplishments and discoveries would not have happened had the nation not made the hard decisions that enabled these projects to carry through in spite of scheduling delays and cost <coughs> growth. And we've been well rewarded with countless innovations, thanks to the dedicated and inspired work by NASA, its supporting contractors, and the nation's colleges and universities. One area for improvement is a better agreement on the baseline from which cost growth and schedule <coughs> delay are determined. The inconsistent measurement of cost growth across programs was noted in the National Academy's review of NASA Earth Science and Space Missions in 2010. For example, some people characterize the cost growth of the um, Webb Space Telescope using an initial baseline project cost of $1 billion to $3.5 billion. While this was the initial range cost estimated in 1996, that estimate was not based on a detailed analysis. A detailed analysis is needed to establish the baseline from which NASA makes a commitment to Congress that it can design, develop, and build the project at the cost specified. The initial baseline was established in the fiscal year of 2009, and according to, the, to that baseline, JWST was estimated to have a life cycle cost of about $5 billion. That is a pretty different number than $1 billion. So in closing, Mr. Chairman, this topic is timely. NASA's need to effectively manage its programs 
will gain even more importance as the agency seeks to manage its wide-ranging portfolio in an increasingly constrained fiscal environment while pursuing ambitious goals such as exploring Europa and sending humans far away from Earth. I look forward to a robust discussion at today's hearing, and with that, I'll yield back. Thank you very much. And now I'd like to, uh, in fact, before I recognize our next speaker, I want to also uh, reiterate, thank you for saying this, um, uh, Congressman Barra, the hearing room, I met some of you outside in the hall when I walked up, but I want to tell you that we're elated that we've got all of these NASA interns in here, and uh, we really appreciate uh, uh, the good work you're doing, and uh, just want to pat you all on the back. You're, you're our future uh, in, in the space program. Thank you for being here. Now I'd like to introduce our, the chairman of the full committee, uh, the gentleman from Texas, uh, Chairman Lamar Smith. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. This committee has demonstrated time and again that U.S. leadership in space is a bipartisan priority. Our vote on the 2018 NASA Authorization Act in April was a clear demonstration of that. Congress and the administration support a consistent, focused space program, and the current NASA budget demonstrates that resolve. NASA once again received one of the most favorable authorizations and appropriations of any agency. Healthy budgets are a good start, but they must be followed up with solid management and oversight to make certain taxpayers' funds are spent well. However, excessive cost and missed deadlines may undermine the very NASA projects Congress and the American people support. We recently held hearings discussing four of NASA's highest profile programs, SLS, Orion, Commercial Crew, and the James Webb Space <coughs> Telescope. The subcommittee will have a hearing next month about the JWST program breach, and Northrop Grumman's CEO has agreed to testify. GAO's report identified significant cost and deadline problems with all four of these high interest programs. SLS and JWST are identified as having deteriorating cost and scheduled performance due to risky decisions involving technology. GAO found that the commercial crew contractors continue to have significant delays in the test flight schedules, and NASA expects the Orion program to exceed its cost baseline. GAO assessed other NASA major projects this year as well. For example, the Wide Field Infrared Survey Telescope remains a serious concern for Congress. This committee has requested but not received the WFIRST life cycle cost estimate that was required by the fiscal year 2018 omnibus. Congress has a responsibility to authorize and appropriate funding necessary to accomplish the task it directs NASA to carry out. But Congress also has a responsibility to not let cost overruns detract <coughs> from other NASA priorities, such as research and small and medium class missions. It is time for NASA contractors to deliver. The 2018 NASA Authorization Act takes important steps to impose a contractor responsibility watch list. This watch list would penalize poor performing contractors by restricting them from competing for further NASA work. Beyond contractor watch lists, NASA should continue to explore additional options to reduce the cost of these large programs, such as leveraging program surpluses, early stage cost caps, firm fixed price contracts, and public private partnerships that benefit taxpayers. Anything short of that will undermine congressional confidence in the contractor's ability to deliver on their promises at a reasonable cost. If space exploration is going to continue to earn the public's trust, then contractors will have to deliver on time and on budget. If they cannot, then they should face sanctions. Now, Mr. Chairman, again, I look forward to our witnesses' testimony today, and uh, yield back the balance of my time. <clears throat> Thank you very much. Now I'd like to introduce the gentlewoman from uh, Texas, the ranking member of the full committee, uh, Ms. Johnson. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman, and thank you for holding this hearing, and thanks to our witnesses for being here. Um, this morning, we hope we are going to get a status update on NASA's management and its programs, particularly cost and schedule status on its large missions. To that end, I hope the hearing will provide answers to us some of our key questions, 
is NASA's ability to manage cost and schedule on its programs improving, or is it getting worse, as the Government Accountability Office seems to indicate in its recent report on NASA's major projects? If it is getting worse, what should be done, particularly by this committee? Cost and schedule can be expected to be difficult projects that push the state of the art in science and engineering. Challenging missions and transformational science are what we expect of space programs worthy of this great nation. That said, Mr. Chairman, we can do better. In particular, we need to improve our ability to identify early on when we can still make design decisions, whether a project runs the risk of exceeding budget constraints, and if so, what options we have at our disposal to make sure the program meets those budget constraints. The Wide Field Infrared Survey Telescope is a good example. After stakeholders, including the National Academies, expressed concerns that the W first could run into potential cost and schedule growth. NASA established expert groups to rigorously review the cost, engineering, and science objectives for the mission. I commend NASA for taking this action. These steps are being taken before a final W first mission design is established, and while there is still time to reconsider the scope and approach for the mission to uh, preclude the possibility of exceeding cost schedule expectations as it starts at development. Mr. Chairman, I look forward to discussing learning opportunities such as this one and determining whether future NASA missions would benefit from incorporating similar processes to minimize the possibility of future schedule delay and our cost increases. One thing I learned early on while serving on this committee is that NASA is a unique engine of innovation, a force for pushing new advances in space technology and operations. That is why I'm anxious to hear from my witnesses on whether cost and schedule models that are based on the past, traditional approaches to national project development are being updated to reflect the changes in today's manufacturing, operations, and technology environment. Is the R&D on cost and schedule models needed? Are there other tools that could help NASA improve the management of cost and schedule in its acquisition of space systems? We do have a lot to discuss this morning, and I look forward to hearing from our witness. Thank you, and I yield back. Thank you very much. Now I'd like to introduce our witnesses. <clears throat> Uh, I'd first, our first witness today is uh, Ms. Christina Chaplin, Director of Contracting and National Security Acquisitions at the U.S. Government Accountability Office. Among other topics, Ms. Chaplin has led reviews on the ISS, the SLS, and Orion crew capsule, as well as commercial cargo and crew projects at NASA. Ms. Chaplin received her bachelor's degree in international relations from Boston University, and a master's degree in journalism from Columbia University. We welcome you. Our second witness today is uh, Mr. Stephen Jerzyk, serving as the Associate Administrator of NASA, the agency's highest ranking career civil service position. Prior to this appointment, Mr. Jerzyk uh, served as Associate Administrator of the Space Technology Mission Directorate where he formulated and executed the agency's space technology programs. Mr. Jerzyk is a graduate of the University of Virginia, where he received a Bachelor of Science and a Master of Science in Electrical Engineering. Thank you for being here. Our third witness today is the Honorable Paul Martin, uh, Inspector General of NASA. Prior to this appointment, Mr. Martin served as the Deputy Inspector General at the U.S. Department of Justice uh, in the Office of Inspector General. Mr. Martin holds a Bachelor of Arts in Journalism from Pennsylvania State University and a Juris Doctor uh, from Georgetown University Law Center. Thank you for being here. Our final witness today is Mr. Daniel Dumbacher, 
uh, the, the executive director of the American Institute of Aeronautics and Astronautics, or AIAA, Mr. Dumbacker, is it Bacher or Backer? Bacher, I thought so. I, I served three years in Germany, so I thought so. Uh, Mr. Dumbacher has previously served as the Deputy direct, uh, Associate Administrator of the Exploration Systems Development Division of NASA's Human Exploration and Operations Mission Directorate. Mr. Dumbacher earned his bachelor's degree in mechanical engineering from Purdue University and a master's degree in business administration from the University of Alabama in Huntsville. He has also completed the senior managers in government program at Harvard University. So I'd like to recognize Ms. Chaplin for five minutes to present her testimony. Chairman Babin, Ranking Member Barra, Chairman Smith, and Ranking Member Johnson, thank you for inviting me today to discuss the cost and schedule performance of NASA's largest projects. Since we began our assessments of ma major projects 10 years ago, we have seen NASA make progress in reducing acquisition risk, but our most recent review found that performance has worsened after several years of following a general positive trend. Specifically, as shown in this graph, the average launch delay, which is the yellow line with dots, increased from seven months in our 2017 report to 12 months in this year's report. This was the first year we could not determine the extent of cost growth because NASA does not have a current estimate for the Orion program. Orion accounts for 22% of about $30 billion of development costs for major projects. Even without including Orion, however, the overall development cost growth increased to 18.8%, up from 15.6% in 2017. We expect this number to increase further once Orion is factored in, and probably even more as large projects, including James Webb, the Space Launch System, and Exploration Ground Systems are in their riskiest phases of development. In regard to this graph, I'd also like to point out that when we started our assessments in 2009, cost and schedule growth was more problematic than depicted. Many baselines had been set just a couple years prior in response to a statutory requirement aimed at enabling more consistent reporting from NASA. So as you can see, it's been a struggle for Congress to hold them accountable for years. Um, also in 2012, you can see the impact that James Webb had on the overall cost growth when its estimate increased from $4.9 billion to $8.8 billion. This next graph depicts some of the reasons why projects experience cost and schedule growth. They're not so different than what we've seen in the past at NASA and across government space programs. Cost and schedule growth was sometimes due to issues beyond a project's control, the light blue circles, which might include a, delivery, a late delivery and the delay of the launch vehicle. In other times, the dark blue circles, it was due to risky management decisions. For instance, human spaceflight programs have been operating with very low cost and schedule reserves, which has limited their ability to address unforeseen technical challenges. In other cases, projects encounter technical problems that can sometimes be avoided and sometimes not. The James Webb program is reporting delays, for example, due to workmanship errors that delayed the delivery of the spacecraft propulsion system and also because of unanticipated complexities involved with unfurling the sun shield, which is unique to the telescope. We're looking at whether more could have been done to avoid the workmanship issues. Since the mid-2000s, NASA has made strides in developing tools and approaches to reduce cost and schedule growth. As shown in this graph, for example, projects are increasingly building more knowledge about critical technologies early so that they do not discover problems when they're more expensive and time consuming to fix. Similarly, they're building more knowledge about design before proceeding into integration. NASA's also improved cost and schedule estimating processes and its oversight processes. While we recognize NASA's progress, we believe more can be done to put programs on a sounder footing. For example, as mentioned earlier, the human spaceflight projects should not be operating with low cost and schedule reserves. Projects should also regularly update cost and schedule estimates, but they are more often reluctant to do so. For James Webb, an updated estimate may have forecasted the current schedule delays if it were done a few years ago. 
We also still find that some projects do not manage contractors well and react only after problems become overwhelming. This year, we saw that workmanship errors on even the smallest of components can sometimes have dramatic impacts. Lastly, NASA should take steps needed to ensure cost growth from a large project does not overwhelm a portfolio. NASA did this recently for its astrophysics portfolio when it undertook an independent review of the WFIRST telescope before the more costly phases of the acquisition process began. This type of assessment should continue. In conclusion, we recognize NASA projects are complex. They face inherent technical challenges. Some cost and schedule growth is inevitable when you push the state of technology. But more can be done to limit management risk that often exacerbates problems. Chairman Babin, Ranking Member Baer, this concludes my statement, and I'm happy to answer any questions you have. Thank you, ma'am. I now recognize Mr. Jerzyk for five minutes to present his testimony. Mr. Chairman and members of the committee, I am pleased to have the opportunity to discuss NASA's program management accomplishments and challenges. NASA is focused on its mission of science and exploration. In support of this mission, the agency has developed a rigorous process for program formulation, approval, implementation, and evaluation. NASA's challenge is to develop and improve our program project management capabilities to ensure both efficiency and accountability. We must execute and deliver missions on cost and on schedule. We have to execute in an environment that includes some significant risk, and we are focused on identifying and characterizing risks as quickly as possible. We must take corrective actions promptly, whether mitigating, accepting, evaluating, or monitoring an identified risk. NASA implements a rigorous process for project formulation, development, and execution. Products proceed through a series of key decision gates. At key decision point C, or what we refer to as KDPC, the agency commits to deliver a project within an established baseline cost and schedule. This agency baseline commitment is the baseline against which we evaluate performance. Beginning in 2009, NASA adopted a joint confidence level, or JCL, approach to producing estimates, and this approach has resulted in improved performance. The JCL employs probabilistic risk assessment to establish a confidence level for an estimate. Typical NASA, typically, NASA establishes baselines for major projects around a 70% confidence level. Since the agency established its JCL policy, pro programmatic performance has significantly improved as NASA has launched more projects at or near their original cost and schedule baselines. NASA is committed to applying a robust set of available authorities to accomplish our mission efficiently and effectively. NASA's strategic acquisition process utilizes multiple authorities to meet agency objectives, including, though not limited to, federal acquisition regulation or FAR-based contracts, grants, cooperative agreements, international agreements, and Space Act agreements. NASA has expanded its use of fixed price contracts where appropriate, with the percentage of funds NASA spends on firm fixed price contracts increasing from 26% in 2013 to 35% in 2016. The JCL approach has certainly improved our performance, and we look forward to building on this success to address our ongoing challenges with major projects. NASA is working to strength strengthen program planning and control through a series of initiatives including the application of industry standard earned value management processes. NASA began the process of applying an in-house EVM capability in 2013 and has broadened its use in a stepwise fashion over time. NASA is leading an effort through the schedule initi initiative to strengthen schedule management by building a community to identify and reinforce schedule management best practices. Our decision our decision to conduct independent reviews of both WFIRST and JWST missions, along with our continued support for regular GAO reviews and audits, illustrate our commitment to transparency and our determination to identify risks as early as possible and immediately take action to mitigate them. Finally, Mr. Chairman, NASA will continue to accept the big challenges that the committee and the nation place before us. Our missions will continue to incorporate cutting edge technologies and to pursue the challenging goals that can only be accomplished in the hostile environment of space. NASA missions do things that have never been done before. The Parker Solar Probe will dive into the sun's corona. The James Webb Space Telescope will unfold itself almost a million miles from Earth 
and operate at minus 380 degrees Fahrenheit. The Space Launch System, or SLS, will enable humans to travel deeper into space than ever before. These missions will employ technologies that must be developed and tested on Earth, but can only be demonstrated in space. All this is to say that NASA must accept a risk, but we are committed to managing that risk and executing within our cost and schedule commitments. Thank you for the invitation to testify before you today. I look forward to answering any questions you may have. Thank you, Mr. Jersey. Uh, I would like to now recognize Mr. Martin for five minutes to present his testimony. Thank you, sir. Yes, Members sir. of the subcommittee, over its 60-year history, NASA has been responsible for numerous scientific discoveries and technological innovations. However, many of NASA's largest projects cost signif significantly more to complete and take much longer to launch than originally planned. Our office has examined NASA's successes and failures in project management by examining the long-standing challenges the agency has faced in meeting cost, schedule, and performance objectives, as well as the tools it has developed to address these shortcomings. We identified four factors that present the greatest challenges to successful project outcomes. One is NASA's culture of optimism. Two, underestimating technical complexity. Three, funding instability. And four, development of new project managers. My remarks this morning address the first two of these challenges. Optimism. Exemplified by the agency's greatest achievement, landing humans on the moon and safely returning them to Earth, NASA's ability to overcome obstacles has become part of its can-do culture. However, our work has shown that this attitude contributes to development of unrealistic plans and performance baselines, particularly with respect to its largest projects. Technological success often at a significantly greater cost than originally estimated, tends to reaffirm a mindset that project cost and adherence to schedule are secondary concerns. In fact, several people offered a name for this phenomena, calling it the Hubble psychology, or an expectation that projects that fail to meet initial cost and schedule goals will receive additional funding and that subsequent scientific success will overshadow budget, and schedule problems. The Hubble Space Telescope was two years late and about a billion dollars more than initial estimates, but most people don't remember that. Instead, they rightfully remember its stupendous images of the universe. While a few projects in NASA's recent past have been canceled because of poor cost and schedule performance, a too-big-to-fail mentality pervades agency thinking when it comes to NASA's larger and most important missions. While understandable, given the investment of agency resources, cost overruns in these projects can result in delays to other missions as funding is reprioritized. Technical complexity. The technical complexity inherent in NASA projects remains a major challenge to achieving cost and schedule goals with project managers attempting to predict the amount of time and the amount of money needed to develop one-of-a-kind and first-of-their-kind technologies. We found that NASA historically has underestimated the level of effort needed to develop, mature, and integrate such technologies. To help project managers avoid cost and schedule overruns, NASA has implemented a number of initiatives. I highlight two this morning. JCL, required since 2009 for all NASA projects with life cycle costs exceeding $250 million, a JCL analysis calculates the likelihood a project will achieve its objectives within budget and on time. The process uses software models that combine cost, schedule, risk, and uncertainty to evaluate how expected threats and unexpected events may affect a project's cost and schedule. Our examination of NASA's use of JCL found mixed success, with the tool unevenly applied across agency projects. Contracting. NASA makes use of multiple procurement vehicles for its projects, including fixed-priced and cost reimbursement contracts, as well as funded Space Act agreements used to spur development of commercial cargo and crew capabilities. 
As NASA looks increasingly to the private sector to leverage its resources, it must ensure that the contracting mechanisms it chooses are best suited to maximize the agency's significant investments. In sum, to meet cost and schedule goals, agency leaders must temper NASA's historic culture of optimism by demanding more realistic cost and schedule estimates, well-defined and stable requirements, and mature technologies early in project development. In addition, Congress and NASA managers must ensure that funding is adequate and properly phased. Finally, the agency must be willing to take remedial action up to and including termination when these critical project elements are not present. In our judgment, meeting these project-related challenges can only be accomplished through leadership that articulates a clear, unified, and sustaining vision for NASA and provides the necessary resources to execute that vision. Thank you, sir. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Martin. Now I'd like to recognize uh, Mr. Doombacher uh, for five minutes to present his testimony. You may want to push your, push your button there, I'm sorry. Yeah. Chairman Babin, Ranking Member Barra, and distinguished members of the subcommittee, thank you for this opportunity to address you today. Your support for the nation's space program is to be commended. I sit before you as a former NASA program manager, former educator, and as the current executive director of the world's largest aerospace professional society. Let me first say that the work NASA employees and its industry partners do is purposely challenging. The NASA industry team should be commended for their accomplishments under such tight constraints. Programs are complex, and a great deal of planning and commitment is necessary to execute a successful mission. Every program has its unique challenges. The NASA industry team works hard to address these issues, develop solutions, and incrementally make progress toward the respective missions. No matter how much planning takes place or how well thought out the plan, it's difficult to estimate the cost and schedules of these complex one-of-a-kind projects. All federal government departments and agencies are operating in a time of heightened fiscal responsibility and accountability. Accordingly, NASA has updated policies and guidance to focus on formulation and implementation with robust cost estimating, well-defined baselines, designs, and risk postures at key decision points, and formal requirements and, and guidance. Especially during the implementation phases of its projects, NASA has processes to ensure that rigorous cost assessment is performed. Program progress is tracked through the periodic performance review process. Since NASA instituted its joint confidence level policy nearly a decade ago, NASA's cost and schedule performance has improved. From my perspective, the issues experienced in the NASA projects can be assessed in two categories. One, the need for stable, predictable, and consistent funding, and workforce development. Simply stated, project management has three basic knobs, content, schedule, and cost. A change in any one of these three variables directly affects the other two. Cost and schedule issues do arise when there are unanticipated changes to a program or when development challenges arise, particularly during first-time production and when technical capability is being pushed. Disruptions to the budget process and funding stream, along with major policy and priority shifts, affect schedules and contracts and ultimately lead to additional cost. It is also quite difficult for NASA to plan and implement programs without sufficient resources or reserves. A key issue is projects developed under a flatline budget. A flatline budget requires project managers to realign the work as they go to stay under the budget cap, resulting in hard priority decisions and inefficiencies that explicitly break the program linkages across schedule and budget. These circumstances can and do add to program cost and move schedules to the right. We learned this lesson with the International Space Station, and yet now we are repeating it with SLS and Orion. The current budgeting process, including the regular use of continuing resolutions, late year appropriations, and threats of government shutdowns, results in endless multiple planning scenarios. As stated in October 2015 testimony before this subcommittee, the need to constantly have backup plans for various potential appropriations outcomes, different budget planning levels, along with flexible workforce blueprints invites confusion and miscommunication. A related issue is the inability of NASA to include appropriate budget and schedule margin in its program planning due to externally imposed constraints. 
Planned margin is difficult to include because it becomes the first target for budget reduction in the budget and appropriations process. A separate but related issue that must be addressed is the workforce challenge impacting the aerospace community as a whole. There remains a nationwide shortage of workers for jobs requiring science, technology, engineering, arts, and mathematics. According to Aviation Week's 2017 workforce study, nearly 30% of the nation's aerospace and defense workforce is over the age of 55 and 22% are younger than 35. More concerning is the lack of development program experience. The vast majority of the NASA human spaceflight workforce has been hired and trained after space shuttle development. Space station development has provided on-orbit expertise. However, launch system development experience is minimal. NASA expertise that developed the space shuttle has mostly retired or passed away. For the United States to continue its long-held space exploration leadership, significant investments must be made in addressing the workforce development via hands-on, real-world hardware programs and research. Key technical challenges for the future of space exploration, such as nuclear propulsion, on-orbit assembly, and human survival and microgravity, should be addressed. Such investments would meet key research and engineering needs while providing valuable experience. A well-developed leadership bench is also necessary for a program's mission success. This ensures the appropriate expertise to assess and balance risk and priorities. In conclusion, I thank this committee for the opportunity to to talk today and look forward to your questions. Thank you, Mr. Dumbacher. We appreciate it. Uh, now, I would like to recognize myself for uh, five minutes uh, for questioning. And um, uh, well, I have a bunch of questions, and I'm sure everybody else does too. So if you could just get right to the point, answer these things, because we want to get cover as much of this important ground as we possibly can. NASA has a storied history with overrunning costs and schedules for space systems development. Some of these programs have even suffered cancellation as a result, and this has simply got to stop. We need performance, not excuses, from the agency as well as providers. And with that in mind, uh, of NASA's options, what acquisition mechanisms, such as cost plus, fixed price, or space act agreements, are most useful in promoting performance and holding the provider as well as the agency management accountable for meeting the acquisition requirements. And I'd ask you uh, first, uh, Mr. Dumbacher. Uh, Congressman, I think the uh, appropriate acquisition tool depends on the objectives of the program uh, and the, goal, and the uh, scientific uh, engineering issues and risks associated with that. Uh, we typically, we have a lot of experience with cost plus contracts in this country. Uh, NASA uses that a lot for its major programs. There is the discussion of public-private partnerships, uh, which can also be valuable and has been tried in the past, some successful, some not. Uh, when we consider all of this, we need to consider the objectives that are for the program, uh, what are the incentives and the motives uh, that are necessary uh, for success both in terms of how it would apply in a public-private partnership as well as a co cost plus arena. And we need to sort through those and make valid, conscious, sub uh, objective decisions. Thank you. And now the next, uh, that same question, uh, Ms. Chaplin, if you would answer that. I don't need to, need to repeat it, right? Right. Okay. So um, with fixed price contracts, the contractor bears the most risk for meeting costs and schedule goals. So that's your main aim, that's a contract, but um, it's not really appropriate when you're facing a lot of unknowns at the beginning. If you're really stretching technology, you don't know how long it's gonna take, how much it's gonna cost. In that case, the government does need to bear the risk of, of the contract, and that's where Cost Plus comes in. Okay, thank you. And then uh, we're, we're talking about uh, cost plus, so I'm, I was gonna, the, the second part of my question to you, you two, do cost plus contracts provide any incentive for the provider to complete the project on time and on schedule? They're typically incentives built into the contract and they come through the award fees. Um, so some may be tied to performance and quality and things like that, but others could definitely be tied to cost and schedule. Okay, all right, thank you. And Mr. Dumbacher. Uh, just to add a little bit to that, 
when we have done award fee, cost plus award fee, and incentive fee in the past, we do and can make uh, schedule performance and cost performance part of the evaluation criteria, and that is typically included. Okay, thank you. And then uh, to Mr. Martin and uh, Ms. Chaplin as well. Acquisition encompasses a great deal, including strategic planning, procurement processes, and the development of, cl of clear requirements. For many years, the DOD has employed a robust training and certification program for defense acquisition professionals. What institutional improvements such as training, certification, and career progression are necessary or perhaps missing from NASA's acquisition processes? I know NASA has invested pretty heavily in training cost estimators and project management. They have conferences every year, for example, but I still think maybe more could be done in that area um, in certain techniques and especially more program management issues related to managing contracts. Okay, and then Mr. Martin? Attracting and retaining the project managers is a, is a real challenge for the agency. As Mr. Dumbacher suggested within NASA, 50% of the workforce is over 50 years old. And with a diminishing number of small projects for these project managers to really get the experience and cut their teeth on, it's a real concern. Okay, and then do you think NASA can gain from DOD's experiences? I'm not as familiar with DOD's experiences. Okay, Ms. Chaplin? I think that Defense Acquisition University is a very good model for training um, programs and all kinds of issues. It's something NASA could look toward. Okay, thank you. Uh, Mr. Jerzyk, uh, NASA recently took steps to control the cost of the Europa Clipper and W First missions while in, in formulation. Have these steps proven helpful, and can similar measures be implemented on other major projects to control the cost? Uh, yes, on W First, um, we did an independent, had an independent review board come in and look at the project early in phase A in formulation. And they confirmed that the project scope had grown and they were not going to be able to execute the, the mission within the $3.2 billion uh, budget that we had for, their, for, their, for them for the management agreement. They made some recommendations. The project took those recommendations and adjusted the scope and replanned the cost and schedule estimates. And they came in and presented their baseline to the Agency Program Management Council outside chair. And, uh, and we have confidence based on their estimate, uh, given the replan, that they have a solid estimate uh, at uh, going into uh, going into phase B. So I think that that uh, and, and similarly for your Europa Clipper. So I think that is a uh, way to uh, try to minimize cost and schedule risk early in the program. Okay, <clears throat> I'm out of time. I had several more questions, but uh, thank you very much. I'd like to recognize the gentleman from California, the ranking member, uh, Mr. Bear. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, each of you in your opening statements obviously touch on the complexity of budgeting and, and scheduling when, when you're trying to do something that you may never have done before. Um, and, and I have to imagine, you know, when we started on the Apollo missions, you know, lots of cost overruns, lots of um, scheduling delays, but as you got further down the road, understood what we had to do, that started to, to, to reduce and there was more predictability. Um, you know, as we think about future missions, and you know, let's put it in the context of something we talk a lot about, um, Mars by 2033, we don't know how we're gonna do that. We don't know the technology and the science and, and everything else. Um, as we go into deeper space, you know, we are encountering more complicated projects um, as we look at the, the balance of the commercial sector, the entrepreneurial sector, more reliance on external entities. You know, when we did Apollo, NASA was the launch vehicle, the, the landing vehicle, the science mission. Maybe a little bit more control as, as you think about working with outside contractors and, and, and new startup companies that, are, that may be a little bit more unpredictability. I think that adds another variable as the international community becomes much more engaged, as you see um, you know, countries like India, Japan, the European Space Agency start to do some of the science, another complicated variable. So as opposed to budgeting and scheduling getting easier, my sense is budgeting and scheduling is gonna get more difficult. Is that a reasonable, reasonably accurate thought? I guess Ms. Chaplin. 
Well, I would like to note in the Apollo era, a lot of things had never been done before. So they were very difficult to estimate. I think now we have the benefit of time and history that there are a lot of things we can estimate even if we haven't done that particular mission. Um, and I also know that in the past decade, the three space agencies, um, DOD, NRO, and NASA have been working very closely together to kind of gain that historical perspective and costs and build databases. So there is more knowledge there that gives you an advantage. But yeah, those other complexities do make it hard. Right, and you know, as we th think about that, learning from what, what we've done in the past, trying to create more predictable models of, of budgeting and scheduling. You know, you, I think um, to Chairman Babin's question, you know, I'll, I'll put it in the context of um, my profession as a, as a doctor. You know, we'll often, and as, as we're caring for populations of patients, we'll have a shared risk pool that says, okay, you know, for a certain fee, you know, we're going to take care of this population of patients. If we do really well, we improve health, et cetera. There's a reward on, on, on that end. If, on the other hand, we do a bad job taking care of those patients, we share some of that risk. And I don't know if in contracting, I think you touched on you know, the shared risk award fees, et cetera. Have you noticed in that type of contracting that you actually get better predictability when the, the contract, you know, again, not doing something that we know how to do and is pr pretty predictable, but you know, something where there is some risk involved. And I don't know. If Ms. Chaplin, if you want to answer that, or Mr. Martin, if you want to take that. Let me just toss in that you know, over the last 10 years, NASA has moved to a new uh, procurement mechanism, the Funded Space Act agreements, particularly to spur development of transportation capabilities for cargo and crew services to the International Space Station. Now, NASA contributes significant billions of dollars to the Funded Space Act agreements, but the commercial companies also have a significant financial stake in the game. So having them have the, their skin in the game as well to develop these private capabilities of which NASA will be a, procure them as a service, I, I think is an interesting and has been relative, relatively successful. Has it increased uh, cost, schedule, and timing? Uh, not particularly. Mr. Jerzyk. Yeah, as I said before, we choose kind of either a FAR-based you know, contract uh, either cost reimbursement or uh, fixed price or a uh, public-private partnership where it makes sense. Particularly public-private partnerships where there are, there are shared strategic, strategic common interests between ourselves and an industry partner or partners, that makes a lot of sense. And therefore, there's, we also share the risk there uh, in that partnership. Um, we, we did do a, uh, a reimbursable Space Act, uh, Act agreement, a funded Space Act agreement for uh, cargo. We've kind of moved away from that approach because of our ability to uh, have insight and manage. And our latest public power partnerships have actually been through uh, fixed price contracts with cost sharing, where we use the FAR rules to, uh, to uh, manage the, the, the relationship uh, and allow the contractor to contribute resources and share the risk. Right. I'm out of time, so I'll just move on. Thank you very much. And I'd like to recognize the chairman of the full committee, uh, Mr. Smith from Texas. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, Ms. Chaplin and Mr. Martin, uh, a lot of NASA contractors seem to not be able to stay on schedule. They fall behind. Uh, they end up with cost overruns and, and uh, uh, fail to perform as we expect them to do. In the, 2018 NASA Authorization Act, we have a watch list for contractors who don't perform well. And um, let me, before I get to my specific question, let me just say that I think the American people are rightfully sometimes frustrated by the federal government when things go wrong, when projects uh, end up not being performed as they should, when there are cost overruns, when the deadlines are missed, and somehow no one is held accountable. No one is responsible. It just happened. And I think that is frustrating to the American people when they see projects that cost millions, if not billions of dollars more than expected. So I'd like to ask you all who you think would be good candidates for that watch list. Uh, the watch list is just that. These are uh, contractors who need to be watched more closely, uh, who need to be reminded of their contractual obligations, and perhaps sanctioned if they don't improve their performance. But uh, given your investigations, who are some of the contractors that we might consider putting on such a watch list? 
And Ms. Chaffin, if we start with you, if we could. In, uh, it's, it's a difficult question because in some cases there's a shared responsibility between NASA and the contractor, so it's hard to parse out who's really responsible for that overrun. Even when it comes to like a workmanship issue, there could be some shared responsibility there. If you look at the provision you were talking about, um, there, there are a couple of projects in our list where performance has been bad consistently over time, and NASA's actually canceled or proposed canceling a project or is looking at whether to do that because okay. contractor performance in those and cases. Who were, who were those contractors? Um, one is um, for the SGSS project, that would be General Dynamics. So that project's being looked at. Performance has been a longstanding issue on that. Okay. The other one was the um, RBI instrument, which is a weather satellite sensor. That one was proposed for termination. That was Harris Corporation and formerly Excellus. That those are the more extreme cases okay. that could possibly. But it's ultimately like NASA's decision, and they have to Understand. really investigate the situation. Okay, thank you, Mr. Martin. In your testimony, you made a couple of really good suggestions. I thought uh, to try to avoid the too big to fail syndrome. Uh, what are some other ways we can hold contractors accountable? We have the watch list. What are some other uh, things that we can do to keep projects on time and on budget? Well, I think one of them is what you're doing here today is an oversight hearing and the proposed hearing uh, several weeks from now to focus on the issues specific to JWST. Right. I think aggressive oversight by GAO and the IG's office is important. And I think just a general sense that folks need to be held accountable for uh, you know, there's human failure, we all fail, but there is avoidable human mistakes on some of these projects. For instance, the improper use of a solvent uh, mm -hmm. on the JWST by Northrop Grumman, uh, inadequate welding on the SLS core stage uh, by the Boeing as the prime contractor. So we have individual avoidable mistakes. We have issues with our international partnerships, which are key to the future of NASA, but when the European service module is 14 months behind schedule, that impacts the, the, Orion. Right. Uh, final question for you and also I think for uh, Ms. Chaplin, and it is this, that it is very unlikely that NASA's budget is going to see a significant increase, say 25 percent anytime soon. It's just not the nature of our uh, spending uh, and various constraints are going to prohibit, I think, any agency from getting a significant increase. We're fortunate, I believe, to have NASA have sort of a flat line budget. So many agencies, other agencies have been cut. Um, yet there are a lot of people and pundits who expect us to keep the International Space Station as is, go back to the moon and then on to Mars. Uh, and seem to be able to think we're going to do everything all the time. I think that, in my opinion, is not being willing to make some difficult decisions. Realistically, I don't think it's possible. Uh, I think it's very naive to think we can do everything all the time. Uh, do you agree with that assessment, or is, am I missing? Is there some magic solution that will enable us to do everything all the time, or are we going to have to take a hard look at some of these big missions, like and either ones that we already have, like the space station, or others to come, like the moon and Mars? No, you're not missing. I think it's all about choices. Um, there's a finite amount of resources, and you're right, NASA has been very fortunate in the budgets it's received over the years. But that's why cost and schedule estimation is so important, to come up with realistic cost and schedule so you can put it before the decision makers at NASA and in Congress. Had NASA been able to say that the, that the uh, James Webb Space Telescope was going to cost $8 billion 10 years ago when it was proposed, then it's a decision. You do James Webb, and I'm not suggesting it should or shouldn't have been done. It's going to do amazing things when it's up there. But you make a decision based on that. But if you say yes to James Webb, you're saying no to a lot of other things. Right. And that's what we have to appreciate and recognize and understand. Uh, my time is up, but Ms. Chaplin, can you give us a really brief response to that as well? I think NASA is at risk of having too many programs to pay for at one time. Even if you look at what we've been looking at over the years, we started out with 15 to 16 projects. That helped them reduce cost overall. Okay. Now we're looking at 26. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Great questions, and thank you. Uh, now recognize the gentlelady from uh, Texas, uh, Ms. Johnson. 
Thank you very much. Uh, Ms. Chaplin, in um, your 2017 assessment of NASA's major projects, you indicated that in October 2015, NASA decided to decentralize its independent assessment function and deploy the staff to the agency's centers, in part to better use its workforce to meet program needs in areas such as program management and cost estimating. GAO had previously reported on the potential risk that this change could pose for project oversight, but stated that it was too early in the transition to assess its effort, effect on agencies such as independence, the uh, robustness of the reviews, and information sharing. So now, one year later, are you able to tell us whether that decentralization it was successful? We haven't seen a real visible impact either way yet. We're still very concerned about that move. I think it's beneficial to the agency to have centralized expertise in those areas. They really can leverage each other a lot. Mr. Jersek, do you have any comment? Yeah, I think we've uh, moved to a model where we're putting the responsibility and accountability of the mission directorates who manage the programs to do that independent assessment. And so far, they've stepped up to the job, and I think they're doing an effective job in, uh, man in implementing our, our uh, spaceflight project management processes, including reviews. Uh, we do ha still have a cadre of uh, experts in the office of the chief financial officer um, that have schedule and cost assessment expertise that the, um, the, uh, the review boards can draw on. And we've also given stewardship of project planning and control to the office of the chief financial officer. And that's been uh, very beneficial. And not only this uh, cadre of people for scheduling and cost estimating, but uh, improving our skills and uh, processes and capabilities in cost and schedule estimating and management. Okay, let me ask you this. Um, what are the most important things that NASA can do to minimize costs and schedule growth? And when NASA is faced with an unexpected cost growth and schedule delay, what are the trade-offs that NASA can make? And give me some examples of successful trade-offs. Yeah, so, um, you know, I think um, we continue to mature and, uh, and, and effectively apply the joint confidence level process um, is going to be really important. I've seen since 20, 2009, I've seen the value of that and uh, budgeting uh, projects at the agency baseline come in at the 70% confidence level. And I think we can do even better there in maturing that process. And, I, and I've seen success, and I think we can continue to have sex there. I think we, can, we can need to continue to focus on development of the project management workforce and the pl program planning control workforce has been as uh, has been uh, noted, including um, you know hiring and developing the talent through hands-on project and manage uh, project management and project experience and and training. Um, about 15 years ago, we identified a shortage of skills in project planning and control, and we've really taken on an effort to. Um, hire and train people in that area, cost estimating and schedule estimating management, and I think that's paid off. We need to continue to do that. Um, we talked about independent assessments, and we can, can continue to strengthen independent assessments. Um, and then we have a capturing in uh, communicating lessons learned and looking for systemic issues and challenges across programs and putting corrective action plans in place to deal with those, um, like the shortage of program planning and control uh, staff. Um, we need to continue to do that, and I think all those things can uh, can lead to improve program project, continue to improve program project performance. Thank you very much. My time's about out, but any other witness would like to comment on it? Any of the questions? I would just add a couple more things to his list. One would be to update cost estimates and schedule estimates as risks change over time. We see programs reluctant to do that. And then focusing more on quality management because these work issues come up all the time. There has been efforts to focus on that, but I think more can be done. Uh, Congressman, I would like to add also, there's also th there is a need to recognize that you need appropriate skills for the portion of the program life cycle you are in. So development skills are needed up front in a development program, operational skills at the end, and we need to make sure that we're working for the right skills at the right time. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Chairman.
Yes, ma'am. Thank you. <clears throat> I'd like to recognize the gentleman from uh, Oklahoma now, Mr. Lucas. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And thinking about the questions that my colleagues have had, Mr. Jerzysk, let's discuss for a moment. In January of 2018, GAO found that the commercial crew program contractors, Boeing and SpaceX, experienced additional schedule delays for their demonstration missions and their certification of the vehicles for human spaceflight, and these delays could jeopardize the ability of NASA to maintain access to the International Space Station. Will there be a gap in U.S. access to the International Space Station? No, there will not be a gap in access. We've taken actions, and we have other actions we can take to minimize the risk of a gap. So the first action we have taken is to buy three more seats on Soyuz, and that extends the, that extends the ability to access station via that capability and minimizes the risk of any gap between our Soyuz uh, contra contracted seats ending and commercial crew coming online. There's a couple other things that we're looking at. Uh, one is adding a third crew member to the first Boeing crewed flight. That'll, that'll be important. The other is extending missions from approximately 140 days to 190 days and being able to space the launches, the Soyuz launches out. And that, that's other actions we can take to further mitigate any risk of a gap. But you're confident that uh, the direction the contractors are going, that we won't have to use those measures? Um, we, this summer, we're engaging in an assessment of the schedules for both SpaceX and Boeing, and we'll have a better handle on our, whether we need to uh, take those additional measures at the end of this summer. We'd be glad to report back to you on that. Fair enough. Mr. Chairman, that answers my question. Yield back. Yes, sir. <clears throat> Thank you. Now I'd like to recognize uh, the gentleman from uh, Virginia, Mr. Byer. Mr. Chairman, thank you very much, and thank you all for being here. Uh, Ms. Chaplin, you mentioned that it would be helpful to have much more frequent updates of cost and timelines, um, that these come very sporadically. I know in the family business, we update uh, the projections at least once a month. Here in the federal government, we're getting all kinds of monthly reports on new home sales and unemployment claims and new jobs created. What's, why are NASA or why are the contractors reluctant to update on a regular basis when it would be probably a lot easier to tolerate? Yeah, it would be easier for them if they continually did it because then it wouldn't be such a chore to do it after a couple years. But right now, they set the baselines when they really start their program and they don't revisit. And um, in some cases, I think they don't want to revisit. They don't want to really show to the world like what the cost truly is at that point. Um, but you'd really have to ask the programs. I think it's a, a healthy thing to do when you see conditions change. And in, in the James Webb program, there were a lot of things that had changed in a few years. The cryo cooler, for example, took way longer to manufacture than anticipated that would have been a good time to reassess where the project stood, but they, they didn't do it. This may be one of the things as we move forward is looking at requiring much more frequent updates on both cost and timeline. Mr. Dombacher, this may be more of a, of a rhetorical editorial comment, but you, you write, <clears throat> the current budgeting process, including the regular use of continuing resolutions, late year appropriations, threats of government shutdown, result in endless multiple planning scenarios, that uh, resolving complex technical issues, hold schedules, and predicting accurate flight dates is difficult when the budget is constantly in flux. Is it then credible to say that Congress plays a role in the uh, problems that NASA has with budget and timeline? Uh, yes, sir, I would say that. Yeah. Uh, you don't need to say any more. <laughs> <laughs> but thank you for making that so clear. Um, Mr. Jerzyk, why not over under promise and overperform. I know that's what my children do with me. Um, yeah. uh, so, uh, you know, our, our job um, on, in any given program area is to optimize the portfolio and deliver the most science or exploration uh, missions that we can for the budget given. Um, so we have, uh, you know, taken an approach of um, having a portfolio of small, medium, and large missions. Um, and an approach where we um, budget these missions at the 70% confidence level. Uh, we think that balances the risk of projects in formulation and, uh, and implementation against the uh, opportunity cost of budgeting more than at the 70% confidence level and delaying starting new missions. So um, it's, it's a matter of uh, optimizing 
the portfolios and delivering the most science and exploration content we can for the budget that we have given. I would suggest too that part of optimizing that is managing the expectations of the people whose expectations you have to. Yeah, we can definitely do a better job at yeah. managing expectations. Mr. Martin. I think one of the other realistic things is if you underpromise, you're uh, you're in greater danger of not getting your project started uh, in the first place, of attracting enough excitement and attention to get the, the project funded. So I think what NASA's problem is often is they overpromise, obviously, overpromise the maturity of the technology. I was struck in, in the, like a lawyer, going over the footnote on page three of our written statement. There's a, a quote from former Administrator Griffin. Uh, I think he was current administrator at that time, talking about uh, the projects, proponents of individual missions downplay the technical difficulty and risk uh, grossly at times uh, in order to gain new start funds. I think that has been a historic problem for NASA. You, you raised two interesting pieces in your testimony, Mr. Martin. One was that there was this culture of optimism um, that was too optimistic, and number two, that we needed a far more accountability. But at the same time, um, the dilemma with the accountability is we also have a shortage of the talent that we need. You know, more than half are over 50 years old, the ch proud challenge with getting the STEM kids. How do you ratchet up accountability and not depress um, you know, the enthusiasm, the, the sense of, of, of worth, and also how do you dampen down the optimism in an agency that has to be so optimistic? It's an incredibly difficult. You're dancing on the edge of a knife when you do that because, as you point out, you have to have that optimism, that, that free thinking, to, to really think of things that have never been built before, to conceptualize them and then actually put to start bending metal on them. So it's an incredibly different balance. Um, if it was easy, NASA would be doing it. I mean, it is rocket science after all. And so it is a very difficult, and I just think, like I said, NASA has uh, brought in a lot of its cost estimating techniques and its JCLs and other processes. They just need to, to force adherence to it, to those uh, requirements. Great, great. Thank you. Mr. Chair, I'll yield back. Yes, sir. <clears throat> Thank you. Uh, now I'd like to recognize a gentleman from Alabama, Mr. Brooks. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I am concerned by the perceived transition process away from the current operational format of the International Space Station. Uh, there has not been, in my judgment, uh, enough substantive public debate on what this transition involves. Uh, with that as a backdrop, I have a question directed at uh, Ms. Chaplin, Director uh, Contracting National Security Acquisitions, GAO, and NASA Associate Administrator Stephen Jersick. Um, first, has NASA come up with a definition of what commercialization of the International Space Station means? Uh, we have not been doing work in that area, and I don't believe they have yet, but I'll let Steve. Yeah, so let me tell you where we are with, um, I would say, the more detailed planning of the station transition. So we released a solicitation not too long ago for studies, industry studies, on uh, transitioning um, space station um, to some sort, of, um, some sort of collaborative or commercial enterprise. Um, we, we're getting the proposals back in this week, uh, and we'll evaluate those. And what we ask for in those studies is uh, the capabilities that commercial thinks they can provide us uh, as compared to what we need and what we have and what we need, need in the future. Um, the second is their technical approach to achieving those capabilities. And the third is their business plan. You know, what is their business plan? Because although we don't have a rigorous definition, um, NASA, sh NASA should be a maybe 20, 30 percent user of a capability, and other government, government entities and commercial entities should uh, also use that capability. We should not be the 80 or 90 percent, you know, kind of anchor tenant of a capability. Or to me, personally, to me, it's not, I would not define it as commercial. Um, so we're going to get those studies back in December, uh, and that will inform a more detailed transition plan. And I think we'd be ready to come to you all and, uh, and present that plan and, and get your uh, feedback and input on it. When do you anticipate having that more detailed plan that you can present to us that we have a better understanding of what this commercialization yeah. means? Yeah, we'll, probably, we'll get the results from the studies in December of this year, so we'll probably need some number of months. So probably, you know, f uh, first half of next calendar year, we'll definitely be able to come back to you and lay that out, informed by that in those industry studies and industry input and what looks feasible in the mid-20s timeframe. 
So you'll be in a position to answer the question in the first six months of 2019. Is that my understanding? Is that correct? Yeah, and um, I, I can take a question to get back to you on a more exact date if you'd like. All right, thank you. Uh, Mr. Martin, your audit of commercial resupply services to the International Space Station report dated April 26, 2018, notes that, quote, SpaceX's average pricing per kilogram will increase approximately 50% under CRS-2, while orbital ATK's average per kilogram pricing will decrease by roughly 15 percent, end quote. The major difference between those contracts is SpaceX's introduction of reusability. Uh, SpaceX has noted multiple times that customers should not expect substantial discounts on reused hardware. Um, my question is this. Are you concerned about whether taxpayers will save money with reusable rockets? And second follow-up question is, is it possible reuse may end up costing NASA and the United States taxpayer more overall? Steve could probably answer this um, more specifically, but I believe there is a slight reduction in the, in the area of 3 to 7 percent for use of a reused SpaceX rocket. And I think it's happened once, if not twice so far, for commercial cargo. So there is a slight reduction in. And my concern, I mean, it's, it's a safety issue. And so the launch services people need to assess the specific rocket and they have access to the rockets before they authorize it for launch. Uh, well, uh, Mr. Jerzyk, since uh, Mr. Martin uh, pointed the finger at you yep. uh, with your insight, can you uh, yeah, I think, what insights you may have on that question. Yeah, I think Mr. Martin is right with respect to the marginal cost reduction uh, with the introduction of usability of the uh, of the first stage of the Falcon 9, and, and they're also working towards re reusing the fairing, and they recently are look, uh, announced that they're looking at an approach to reuse the upper stage also. I think as, we, as they gain experience and as anybody gains experience operationally with the system and they gain experience with reuse, I think there is opportunity to further reduce the risk uh, and, uh, and reduce the cost by understanding what the condition of the hardware is when it comes back and how much effort it takes to recondition it, to refly it. So there's opportunity there. I, I'm not able to predict uh, what additional savings uh, they might achieve through reuse at this point. Is there any chance you could expound on increased risk, risk factor of using a novel approach, i.e. reusable rockets. Yeah, we're, like, like uh, Mr. Martin said, we're, the Launch Services Program is in the process of assessing that risk for our missions, and uh, I can take a question for the record on that to get back with you when that assessment will be done. Please. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. And I'll recognize the uh, gentleman from Pennsylvania, Mr. Lamb. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, everyone, I, I appreciate you highlighting the difficult position that you're in when it comes to unpredictable funding streams, threats to shut down the government, funding by CRs, that kind of thing. Uh, I'm trying to learn a little bit more about how that actually affects you on the ground day to day. Can, this is a question for anyone. Um, can you share some more specific examples of how that might have affected a particular project? Well, I'll, I'll be happy to take that because I lived it uh, for a while. And what happens, Congressman, is when you're working on a program and you're trying to put the plan together for the future, and what's my work plan for this year, what's my work plan over a five-year budget horizon, and as I'm working through the appropriations budgeting process, every time I'm, I have to plan to a different number, that means I've got to go back through that planning iteration process. So at a time when the president's budget request was significantly different from what was typically coming from the appropriations process, it was necessary to, to, to A, to do the plan that was supportive and was inclusive in the president's budget request, and I had to be ready as a program manager that if additional appropriations did come in, I at least had an ability to plan and be able to react to that. And what type of program were you managing that you're talking At about? At the right time now? I was doing this, this was the beginning of the SLS and Orion programs. Okay. And so that was a that was a program that was supposed to take how long, kind of from start to finish? Uh, at the time I was there, we were looking at first launch in the 2017-2018 uh, time frame. Uh, and in the while I during the my tenure as the uh, program director for SLS and Orion. 
Uh, we had to deal with a government shutdown, uh, continual negotiations uh, on both ends of Pennsylvania Avenue. And then, uh, and then in addition to that, while I'm doing all that planning, my fo the, the team's focus is pulled away from the day-to-day -day management of these technically complex jobs. So we were working through all of that uh, and actually had to deal with the government shutdown and work through that and then all the multiple planning cycles. Thank you. Uh, Ms. Chaplin, it seemed like you had something to add. Yeah, I think I've heard very similar um, things from other agencies that I oversee, like missile defense, that kind of constant replanning and the chaos and time that it consumes. But another real example of like the impact of a shutdown can have is a cryo cooler test or cryo test at the end of a program like James Webb. It might take a couple of weeks to get the facility ready for this test and then two weeks to cool down. And a shutdown, I think there was a shutdown threat while they were doing that test this time. And they were really worried, like, if we have to shut down, we're going to lose a whole month mm -hmm. of time. Okay, thank you very much. Um, and uh, again, a question for really anyone, because I think it's pressing, but some of you have highlighted the workforce development issues that you have within NASA. Um, and I think it was Mr. Dumbacher that talked about young people, especially leaving NASA for higher paying jobs in the private sector, uh, which is a challenge obviously across the government, it happens in the military too, but if there was one reform you could suggest or one thing that we could improve or strengthen to retain some of this talent and to attract new talent, what would it be? Uh, well, as I stated in my testimony, the one thing I would recommend is good, real hardware programs uh, that to, uh, to go address those technical needs that we need for space exploration and for the NASA mission, but to go give these students, give these young professionals uh, real hands-on hardware experience because that informs their capability and informs their experience throughout their career. I would just like to second that. Um, my The first project I worked on after I got out of college was a space flight instrument development project in-house at NASA Langley Research Center. So I was able to design, build, integrate, test all the way through environment tests, flight hardware. And that experience was, cri was critical throughout my entire career as I moved to a subsystem manager and systems engineer and project manager and then line manager. So I would just second that. I, it per that. Without that experience, I don't know how I would have been able to be as effective as I was as I moved through my career at NASA. And, and if I may just give you a little bit of a story too, if you stand back and look at, there are a group of people of which I was one, Robert Lightfoot was one, where we had the ability and we were asked and required by our mentors to actually test shuttle main engines uh, in-house. And we tested the new technology that ultimately became the final flight configuration for, for shuttle. And that hands-on experience, they, our mentors, our leaders forced us into that because they knew that it fit into the long-term career. Just echoing the same theme, we've heard from a number of project managers that we've spoke with, their frustrations about their spending, agency engineers are spending most of their time overseeing contractors' efforts. And that's frustrating. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Yes, sir. Thank you. Uh, I'd like to recognize the gentleman from Louisiana, Mr. Higgins. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Chairman, it's uplifting to see these young Americans here today, these NASA interns, and I hope, I hope you uh, young men and women are paying attention to these budget discussions. We are a nation that's twenty trillion dollars in debt, and should this body ever managed to produce a surplus of, say, a billion dollars, it would require 20,000 years of a billion-dollar surplus to address a $20 trillion debt. So I'm prayerful that NASA has a spirit of doing more with less, because not only are individual projects at risk, but it certainly anyone can recognize that a $20 trillion debt puts the entire stability of all programs at risk in every government agency. I'm, I'm very hopeful that you young Americans are paying close attention to this conversation. Mr. Martin, I'm concerned about the culture of optimism that you referred to 
and the too big to fail uh, attitude amongst project managers. But I understand their, their perception that their projects are too big to fail because in every case, a tremendous amount of American treasure has been invested in that project. And therefore, it's quite logical for these project managers to have this cavalier attitude of too big to fail. What can this, this committee do? What can Congress do to ensure projects are developed and managed within their budget constraints, in, including, I'd like your, your thoughts, sir, regarding, uh, regarding accountability for our contractors within these projects? Again, I think more frequent conversations with members of Congress about the status of individual projects is important more fidelity to the cost estimating that NASA does right now, and then the occasional example that projects, large or small, are going to be terminated if they go too far over cost and schedule. And in preparation for this hearing, I think the last project that I remember being canceled was something called GEMS. It was a telescope that was supposed to look for uh, evidence of black holes. And it was a, a smaller program from NASA speak. It was capped at $105 million. Uh, and then partway through formulation, they realized an independent cost assessment that it was going to be 20 or 30 percent over that $105 million cap. And NASA canceled it, and it got people's attention. Generally speaking, the, the contractors uh, that, that are involved in cost overruns for NASA projects, large projects, these are for-profit companies, are they not? They are, sir. And it, has that has that ever been addressed within the within the leadership at NASA? That you know, most Americans, if we receive a, a bid from a professional contractor to perform a particular service, then we expect that service performed for the price that was bid, and they're held accountable legally by civil law. And there's a certain expectation of performance when you when you've given a bid. And yet, within the federal government, and certainly within NASA's large projects, there's, there seems to be an attitude of, of, well, we're not really accountable for the actual bid that we presented, and we won't be forced to perform. He's NASA leadership. <laughs> okay, so, um, yeah, the, um, uh, most, a lot of the time we're doing things, building, designing and building systems for the first time that no one else has ever built before. Um, and so in those cases, we use a cost reimbursement contract. And the incentives, and we use incentives to hold the contract accountable through a performance evaluation plan. And those incentives are tied to fee, usually award fee, and that is their profit. Um, so if they do not perform, and they should get a low score against the performance evaluation plan and either receive much less profit or no profit, depending on, on how we weight the incentives in the plan and how they're scored. Um, so given the, the high risk nature, the, the nature of what we do, very complex systems, very high risk with new technology, we take that approach and then we hold them accountable and the ultimate um, uh, price to pay for them if they don't perform is loss of, complete loss of profit. Gentlemen, thank you for your response. Mr. Chairman, my time has expired. If there's a second round, I have a question for Ms. Chaplin. Yes, sir. Thank you very much. Uh, now, the uh, Mr. Foster. Yeah. Yes, sir. Thank you. And I, I guess I'd like to start just by making an observation about the, you know, the, the amount of funding that you can think about having in the, in the next decades. Uh, last week, uh, the Federal Reserve made the historic announcement that household net worth in the United States, the wealth of Americans, just went over $100 trillion. Uh, this is uh, up $45 trillion since President Obama signed the stimulus, reversed the economic collapse, and triggers the, triggers the economic growth that's going on today. So when people tell you there is not enough money to do this or that, the scale for that is what fraction of $100 trillion might we think about um, you know, using to travel to Mars or wherever, whatever your dream is. Um, 
I would also want to say that I resonated as a former project manager and someone doing technical components for uh, large uh, federal projects. I very much resonated with your, your desire to retain in-house expertise. It is very, very difficult to manage a project if you've never done it yourself. And so when I decided that I had to manage a group doing a large number of integrated circuits, I learned all the integrated circuit design control tools and made 10 integrated circuits myself before I decided that now I could sit at the top and, and emit specifications for other engineers. And this is, this is crucial, and we have to look very carefully when we, this rush to privatization uh, runs the risk of losing the in-house expertise that will ultimately cost more money because you'll have projects that are not managed as well as they could be. So I just, we ought to be very cognizant of that. Um, as we contemplate this transition. Now, you know, when I think about cost overruns, you know, there's sort of two big general classes. Uh, the first ones are in enthusiast cost estimates, you know, in the initial scoping of a project. Uh, the, you know, the initial scoping is always done by people who are advocates for the project, and then you have to get adults in the room with experience to actually pull back and say, okay, how does this compare to actual costs? Uh, the other one is legitimate uh, technical risk. And I, I would just like to say that I, I would hope that my colleagues in Congress would be much more tolerant of technical risk. You know, it is okay to take significant technical risk. And if you assemble a group of experts that say success is not assured, but this looks like a good bet, and then it turns out you lose the bet, that Congress should be, you know, very understanding and tolerant. But much less tolerant when, you, when projects are approved, when everyone in the room knows the um, you know, I don't want to point fingers, but I'm sure in your minds you know several projects that, that, were, that have been approved where a large number of the people knew that the, you weren't really going to get the project done for that cost. And it's not just NASA. You know, this happens in, uh, you know, everywhere in the, in the government. And, and so I just was wondering, are there ways that you can uh, identify retrospectively the times when you've had enthusiast cost estimates? Are there any sociological red flags? Uh, that that would allow you to say, okay, I'm suspicious that this is not a real cost estimate. Yeah. I always, um, I can tell, like, when I'm suspicious. It's, it's usually when there are very grand statements made about the program and the achievements that it's going to uh, get seem overly exaggerated. Um, and that's when you start wondering, that, are these estimates real? But I would say in the case of NASA, I kind of trust the process that they have because they do review those estimates pretty carefully. They have standing review boards that look at them before they make their decisions. Um, they could have more independent estimating to kind of compare. That's, that's one thing. But I do believe that their processes now, as opposed to a few years ago, are pretty rigorous in ensuring those estimates are complete. I would just add one thing you said about um, taking risk. You know, that's you need to still do that. I think there is a concern within NASA and other places in the government that we're not taking enough technical risk, that we're too afraid to do that. I, I concur. Um, yeah. With respect to science uh, missions, uh, NASA relies extensively on the findings of the National Research Council and their decadal surveys that identify specific projects. So that, I think that's another check. Uh, as no, no, they to. don't do cost estimates. They're they're sort of given external estimates, is my understanding. I think they do cost. They don't do very good cost estimates, but they do cost estimates. Yeah, good. that's where you need the expertise and, and judgment at that stage. Yeah. Uh, and, and if I may, Congressman, is when I think back on my career and some of the places where I've seen this problem occur the most, one key thing stands out, and that is have the people doing the cost estimate be the ones that will be held accountable for the program execution. Uh, I have seen a couple of instances where the people making the initial estimate, putting the plan together, knew that they were going to be moving on to something else, and then they brought the new person in, and the new person was, what's this? Uh, I think if, you, if, if, if there is an air of accountability, and they know that they're, account they're ultimately accountable for that cost, for executing to their cost estimate, that starts to change, get, get the behavior where I think you want it soci sociologically. Thank you. And it, it's, well, there's a whole set of questions when you go to a, an external contractor model, uh, who does the cost estimate and who takes 
uh, the responsibility in that model. Well, I guess I'm out of time here. Uh, thank you. The chair recognizes Chair, excuse me, Congressman Dunn from Florida. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Uh, jump right in here, Mr. Jerzyk. The Canadian Space Agency last month canceled its participation in the W First uh, project for budgetary reasons. In your assessment, what will the impact be to the technology development and the cost, which results from uh, CSA's decision to uh, pull out of the W First? Yeah. So um, that decision was factored in to the project's. Uh, replanning after the independent review of W first and was factored into the plan they brought forward to move from phase A to phase B. Um, so they've been able to adjust scope and adjust their cost and schedule estimates to stay within the $3.2 billion and still uh, without the Canadian contribution. So that's How does that affect the technology development? Um, I don't think it significantly affects the technology development. I think that um, the project has a really good plan to um, early on uh, develop prototype hardware to right. reduce the risk of that element as well as other elements of high risk. How, how about the mission itself? Does the capability, the mission goals, do they change? Because no, no, the, the level one science goals uh, do not change and they will meet the requirements uh, of the mission as defined in the um, uh, NRC decadal uh, survey for that's astrophysics. That's great news. So uh, the 18 omnibus bill required a life cycle cost estimate by May 22nd. That's behind us. Uh, when will that be submitted to Congress? We'll get you that within the next couple of weeks. Um, it's been done and they're just do, uh, wrapping up the documentation and it'll be here um, hopefully within the next two or so weeks. That's our plan. Great. So many, many people here on the uh, panel have, have called the assessment uh, many assessments that the, the that you need stable predictable uh, funding to plan so let it, let's close our eyes just for a minute and imagine that that Congress might provide multi-year funding authority it's a pleasant function I know but let's imagine that in that scenario how would that uh, how would this authority change your planning for your programs um, well I think it would allow us to only plan once and execute to that plan and deal with the challenges that Mr. Dumbacher had articulated before. The one example that we have of getting multi-year funding um, was OV-105, which is the replacement orbiter after the Challenger accident, um, where Congress appropriated multi-year funding for that uh, project. And they were very successful in executing on schedule and on budget with a profile that ramped up, peaked and ramped down like any project, rational project plan should and having the money, um, the adequate money when they needed it. Uh, so that's just an example of what so, you're talking about. So that about. might actually be good for a lot of different agencies in the government, eh? Uh, for any large complex program uh, that's going to take multiple years to execute, I would think so. I'm thinking Ms. Chaplin would love that, right? So let me, let me uh, in our limited time, so uh, again for, uh, well actually Mr. Jerzyk, you may be under constraints and unable to answer this. I think we're all disappointed that the James Webb telescope cost overruns missed and missed deadlines. What programmatic changes would you make to that program to prevent that in light of that failure? Can you answer that? I can tell you what we okay. have done okay, good. Um, to date. And so the first, the first is a, a series of actions that we worked on with Northrop Grumman. So first of all, we completely restructured the INT organization at Northrop to flatten it and uh, be able to uh, more clearly hold uh, people accountable for getting through the integration and test program. Uh, that also has allowed them to identify and resolve issues in a more timely manager, manner to, imp to minimize the impact of those issues. Um, we've also added uh, staffing to the INT team out at Northrop and we've, um, we've really, I would say, uh, strengthened the mission assurance function and personnel out there to deal with some of the workmanship and quality issues that were mentioned by Ms. Chaplin and others um, to try to avoid these human errors that have caused uh, 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 schedule delays. Um, like was mentioned, a small um, error or problem it has a very large effect on a program like WDOST. I can, I can well imagine in 30 seconds remaining, Mr. Martin, do you have anything to add to Mr. Jerzyk's uh, comments on that? Yeah, we, what, have, we have not done significant oversight of JWST, Congress Director How, about, how about you, Ms. Chapman? Yeah, I believe the actions we've taken have been reasonable. I would note that they were already had some on-site presence over 
and gas, um, but we'll be looking to see how effective those actions are as we do our next review. Well, here's, here's wishing you multi-year uh, uh, funding authority. <laughs> and with that, Mr. Chairman, I yield back. Gentleman yields back. The chair re recognizes Representative Lofgren from California. Thank you, Mr. Uh, chairman. I think this is an important hearing, and we, most of the questions have been asked. But uh, I would like to, to think about what further Congress could do in addition to uh, avoiding the kind of situations Mr. Lam, uh, Lam addressed, the shutdowns issue, the uh, inconsistency between the president's requested budget and what's appropriated that lends uncertainty to uh, the planning process. What could Congress do to limit the uncertainty in funding other than those two issues? The idea of a multi-year uh, funding program for large projects is uh, valuable, but can you give us further guidance to uh, stem losses through our own actions? Um, I'd, I'll start. I, I would say avoid over specifying what your expectations are. Avoid setting dates for a program. Avoid choosing you know how they're going to do it because that limits their choices even more in what they can do. Yeah, I would just echo that. We seem to be getting more and more um, direction through the appropriations process, particularly through the report. Um, and we expect the expectation is we will follow that direction, and that constrains the solution space and our ability to manage effectively sometimes. So I'd say, uh, just to echo what Ms. Ms. Chaplin said, I think that's one additional thing I could think of. With respect to the funding issues, not only the actual dollar amount, it's when that dollar amount comes, the proper phasing of the appropriation has impacted NASA programs. Mm -hmm. uh, I would add, uh, work to make sure that the environment in which we have these discussions is less punitive and more objective and more willing to hear the risks and understand the issues. I think uh, we have to be careful that a lot of the, 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 we can be, if inadvertently set up a vicious cycle of oversight leads to conservatism, leads to more oversight, and it just keeps going around in a circle. And I think what Congress can do and this uh, subcommittee can do because of its oversight activities is to help establish an environment that allows uh, more open communication on these kinds of issues. I think the point that Mr. Foster made all scientists know, which is, uh, Failure is a learning experience. I mean, uh, science is testing and not knowing the answer before you start. And we need to foster that sense of discovery and, and willingness to take risks if we're going to be successful. Uh, let me just close with sort of a parochial question. I uh, represent part of Santa Clara County. NASA Ames is located in um, Santa Clara County. And thinking about the uh, demographic issues we face in NASA with so much of the workforce being over 50 years of age. The NASA Ames uh, facility is located in a key part of the country. It's in Silicon Valley, and there's a lot of synergy between what's going on in the tech uh, community and NASA Ames. And although it's very expensive to live in Santa Clara County, uh, actually, they just built some housing uh, for uh, NASA employees so that it's possible to maintain their that synergy. I'm just wondering in terms of you know that facility as well as others that are co-located with technology centers, what further we can do to move uh, top scientists away from really better paying jobs uh, into the agency uh, to make young people who are smart and who are good scientists want to work in NASA? If anybody has an answer to that. I'll take a try at it. Um, I think what the young people want now are, is similar to what the young people wanted when I got out of school. They want exciting work. They want to know that they have an opportunity to make a difference. Uh, and they want to help solve today and future problems. And I think providing those and then addition to the infrastructure kind of options that, that you have 
described would be extremely beneficial. I think they want to see, from my experience uh, teaching at Purdue for a few years, is if you hit those first three bu bullets, then uh, the students will come. That's why they go to SpaceX and Blue Origin. They see exciting work. That's why they still want to come to NASA, because NASA still has that cachet uh, that it's always had. So exciting work, help make a difference, and do something quick, and, and I think you'll be, you'll be a long way down the road. Thank you very much. I see my time's expired, Mr. Chairman, so I yield back. Thank you for your questions and participation. The chair next rep uh, recognizes Representative Rohrabacher of California. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. I apologize for being late to the hearing. Obviously, two important hearings have to happen at exactly the same time, uh, which perhaps leads me to the first point, which is uh, um, we need to make sure we hold NASA accountable. In our, but um, I have to assume that uh, the Congress isn't doing its job all that well either. I mean, when we're talking about uh, continuing resolutions and omnibus bills. I mean, that's a reflection on the fact that we aren't doing our job here as well. So please don't think uh, if there's any criticism here coming from this end that we don't realize, so at least some of us don't realize, that there is justified criticism on the way Congress is doing its job. Uh, let me uh, ask a couple of questions here about these cost overruns that, and, uh, that seem to be around, they've been around as long as I've been around. And uh, let me ask you this, are we, is a lot of this intentional low bidding on the part of companies in order to achieve a contract? Is this part of that? And uh, whoever can answer that question. You know, we have a pretty rigorous uh, request for proposal and proposal evaluation process, mm -hmm. including independent cost and schedule estimates by the government to ensure that what's being proposed is is actually executable. What's being proposed by the contract is ex executable. So it's not you. You don't see this as a scheme by uh, some big corporation to. Uh, uh, intentionally bid low, get the contract, and then realize we're going to have to pay for it later on. I do not. Okay. Anybody believe that at all? Good. Thank you. That helps our understanding of this. Uh, and a lot of these companies that do have the cost overruns um, are companies that are worth billions and billions of dollars themselves. Uh, if uh, what penalty... Uh, does a company have that goes through a major cost overrun and doesn't meet its commitments to a contract? What's the punishment? So, um, as we discussed earlier, you can take actions to punish companies just through award and incentive fees, but often they're tied to multiple objectives, so you're limited in terms of what you can do. So the ultimate thing is just to cancel a program if you really feel like. Well, what about the next program around? Can, can a company that uh, uh, did not meet its contract be denied uh, the next contract uh, or a contract down the road uh, because they have not uh, uh, met their obligation? Yeah, I think that's possible. And um, the proposal that's in your all's bill about a contractor watch list, they could go on that list if they're not performing well and that NASA will not deal with them in the future for a period of time. Um, that is one option. I well, don't know if you want to yeah, comment. Uh, maybe you could expand on that. Yeah, so what we, what we do now, so first of all, we have a very robust acquisition integrity program within the agency that's run by our Office of Procurement and our Office of General Counsel. And so, you know, they, they along with the programs, look at contract performance, and we'll use the FAR process for suspension and debarment. Uh, for lack of performance or or fraud, wasted abuse, you know. So so we we use we use the existing process. The other thing we do is we have the uh, contract performance assessment reporting system. Mm -hmm. So when we evaluate a contractor on a regular basis, that that assessment goes into that system as well as the assessments of all of the departments and agencies within the federal government. And then not only NASA but other uh, departments and agencies can draw on that to use in assessing past performance of the contract or determine whether to award them anything in the future. Well, it seems to me that uh, we have to be much more diligent on in that area. And uh, if we, unless we have accountability and responsibility for uh, these things, we can expect to have more problems 
and I uh, have to assume that uh, we did not have the amount of discipline in our system and the accountability uh, that will deter companies. Perhaps maybe companies that make bids should be uh, held responsible for that bid, meaning that uh, the money that's lost perhaps should uh, be absorbed by the company. As I, as I say, these are multi-billion dollar companies. And uh, if they are going to be uh, taking the taxpayer money and failing in what they're claiming to do, uh, why should the taxpayer pick it up? Uh, we have, uh, we just mentioned a trillion, we have $20 trillion debt. And my gentleman mentioned how that is, if there's anything that's going to keep us uh, from going into space, it's going to be the total uh, disintegration of our economic system so that we can't afford any of this stuff. Uh, I would uh, also, let me just note that we're also going to have to, we have a $20 billion budget for NASA, $20 billion. We should be able to do a lot with $20 billion. And uh, let me just note that when I first got involved, that uh, I realized the budget wasn't enough to accomplish the missions and that's why I dramatic. I tried to focus totally on international cooperation and private sector investment. So let's hope that we that that's one avenue of making more revenue come in. But we also have to make sure we pay attention to what this hearing's all about: is making sure that we're managing the actual projects themselves in a way to minimize the loss uh, of, of very scarce dollars. So thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Certainly, uh, Chair, thanks to the gentleman for his participation. Uh, we're nearing the noon hour, and we're going to finish by noon. But from what I understand, um, there may be a member who wishes to ask a uh, second set of questions, as long as we are able to do so within that time frame. Uh, the Chair is most comfortable in doing so. Um, Mr. Higgins, did you want to do follow-up? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I have one question. Well, one, one second. Uh, the chair recognizes Representative Higgins of Louisiana for that follow-up. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, for recognizing me and allowing me to ask one question to Ms. Chaplin. Um, Ms. Chaplin, NASA has received multiple recommendations on ways to better develop cost and schedule estimates, as well as perform joint cost and schedule confidence level analysis during the beginning stages of the implementation phase of large projects. In December 2012, it was recommended that the JSWT project update its JCL. According to the report, NASA concurred with this recommendation, and yet no steps were taken to implement. Further analysis indicates that if, if implemented, an updated JCL may have prevented schedule delays. Among the many known and unknown challenges that NASA encounters regarding cost and schedule continuity, can you elaborate on why this recommendation was purposefully overlooked? Um, at the time, they did concur, as you said, so I didn't ever have an official reason why it was overlooked. I think they just were reluctant to relook at their costs. A couple years later, we recommended that they at least do something similar to do a cost schedule risk analysis and really take a deep look at their risks and we even we're going to do that ourselves working with the contractor but that was rejected by the contractor and then it wasn't until um, they were getting ready to work with the launch agency on setting a date that they actually did a schedule risk analysis themselves and realized how far behind they really were. Ms. Chaplin, thank you for your, your, your candid answer. Mr. Chairman, thank you for allowing me to ask this second question. Certainly. Um, any other member wish to ask any other uh, follow-up questions? Uh, seeing none, I thank the witnesses for their valuable testimony and the members for their questions. The record will remain open for two weeks for additional comments and written questions from members. This hearing is adjourned.